this 1971 Hemi Cuda was purchased by Zachary Taylor Reynolds, grandson of tobacco tycoon R.J. Reynolds, on March 30th, 1971 at Ed Owens Chrysler Plymouth in Winston-Salem, North Carolina for $5,000. $291. This CUDA is generally believed to be the highest option, lowest mile, most original 1971 Hemi CUDA in existence today. Widely considered to be two of the foremost leading experts on Mopar muscle cars, Mark Warman and Tony D'Agostino will take an unusually deep dive and discuss the merits of the claim that this is indeed the highest option, lowest mile, most original Hemi Cuda on the globe. You will be the witness. So Tony came in town this week and we decided one of the first things we want to do was get up to the Brothers Collection, our friends up in Salem that have all the amazing cars. And since he knows of a couple of cars that are up there, we were gonna look at them and walk around and check out some of the others. So I'm really looking forward to today. I think it's gonna be a blast. I always do learn things when Tony's out. He learns some things from me as well. Now, while we're gone, I've chosen to leave Will in charge. We have to have a foreman on duty. So Will is in charge of the shop while we're up in Salem. All the tags, I haven't had an opportunity to see this car. You know the car, you got some history on it. Oh my goodness, this you, car. You know everything about I've the car. I've known this car for 20 years. A lot of the cars at this museum I'm very familiar with because I was best friends with the owner, Steve Giuliano. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago, but we've been friends, I won't say forever, but back into the 90s at least, early 90s. Okay, so today we have our 1969 A57 Cuda that is almost at the finish line. Mark has went up north to play house with Tony, look at cars, do whatever they do. While he's up there doing that, I'm in charge down here wrapping this car up to get it back to the customer. This car came to us, actually a pretty complete car, minus the engine that was long gone, but he did get us the correct replacement block to go with the car. So with that being said, we have a very very complete moldings, all the trims there, because these cars are hard to get parts for. So the fact that this car has so many original parts is gonna help us wrapping this car up. So this is a neat little car. First of all, it's an A-body. Second of all, it's a big block, four speed, and it's got the blue on blue. So when you put all those options together, it really is a very unique car. So you never know what you have until the car comes back from the dipper. You kind of see people's past sins when the car comes back. So there were prior repairs to the front inner structure. So as opposed to trying to piece it together, this and that, we found it's way easier just to put a whole front clip on this car. We put a new used clip on the front end, which is very, a lot of very detail-oriented type work, but it saves a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of resources to do it that way. So clipping a car is basically just replacing a large section of the car, whether it be we put a whole new front end on it or we put a whole new back end on it. When you have a lot of repairs that need to be done on the front end, it's not worth doing a patch here, a patch here, a patch here. It's a lot quicker and it's a better job to just remove both aprons with the core support completely off the front end of the car and installing one whole new piece. Okay, so you know the car so much better than I do. Some things that jump out like in the fender tag orientation. Okay. All right. The pictures I see online, I have not seen an original Survivor 70 or 71 Hemi Cuda. So I just go from pictures. Right, there's not too many. And not too many, not too but many. Honestly, you could do that on a, even a Barracuda or any 71 Hemi Trimac car. Okay. The same, you know, this doesn't have to be Hemi Cuda specific. So now this is what I meant earlier when I said how much fun I have learning when Tony's out here. I've seen three fender tag cars before and what that means is that in most cases it means that there are so many options that they wouldn't fit on one tag that they moved it to another tag. And in the case of the Hemi Cuda in 71, it actually got a third tag 
that said Hemi Fender on it. Why is this Hemi Fender tag not mounted in the third hole that's absolutely meant to be there and the tag is right there? Why do you think they did that from the factory? Just didn't know or care? I've seen these before. I've seen them on cars and they're always laid out horizontally. You have the main tag with all the options on it, the secondary tag with some of the options and the VIN to tie it all together, and then the Hemi Fender tag. In this case, the arrangement is incredibly unique and I wanted to get his perspective on it. No. It I, was mass production and... I believe there's a reason behind that. Because you see the, the forward and the rearward screws are both natural, okay? Yeah. Because they're not painted. That's right. Because the way how they painted the tags at Hamtramck, they put a screw in between the two tags. On a double fender tag car. Right. On a single, it was left upper. Right. Uh -huh. Then they lifted up the tags. That's why there's always a bend in them. Painted underneath, and then further on down the line, they put the natural yeah. screws in. That's right. Well, he would have had to put another screw in and bent up that other tag. I know, it, it so, would be weird, but that's the question, right? So that's what they did. Human hands, because like I said, there is the hole for the third screw. I agree with everything Tony is saying about this. I guess the only thing I have a problem with is why wouldn't they follow suit after the tags were painted, putting the screws in the correct orientation? Why wouldn't you just lay them out? There's an extra hole there for the tag to go to the right hand side. And I think, you know, him and I have discussed over the years, these are still human beings doing this work, not robots. And so perhaps it's just somebody on the line decided I'm gonna put it right there because it's quick and it's easy. Who knows? You know, once all the metal work was done, you know, the car went pretty fast. Got it right out to Michael for all the body work. It's nice because this is, a, is not like a second generation charger. You know, it's not 30 feet long. It's a little A body. So we we're able to get the body work done, the prime work done really quick on this thing. So this was one of the cars that we did a pre-paint on like we used to do that we no longer do, thank God. So yeah, once the pre-paint was all done, let it sit for a little bit, got it inside, got it prepped, did the final paint on it, and it just came out amazing. You know, once the car was painted, we got the cut and buff done, got it undercoated, fired it off to Mark and Cousin Dougie to get the drivetrain put in. Cuda is probably one of my favorites at the graveyard and I was really excited about getting to work on an A body with Mark. I was a little concerned about putting a 383 big block in this little A body but it went really smooth. I actually got along with Mark or should I say he actually didn't insult me for a little while. Like I said, the 383 install in the 69A body went really smooth, and after it was in, it looked amazing. When that was done, we put on the wheels and tires and kicked it off to assembly. This, I've never seen this before. I know what it is, but I've never seen it. It's this inspection tag. I've seen little bits and pieces of inspection tags, but I've never seen one with all the parts on it, or at least what appears to be all the parts. Now the breakaway tag, I've never seen that. I know Tony says he has some of those uh, in his stockpile of things he's collected over the years. So tell me how that worked, you, you know. That's an inspector's tag, and you'll see there's uh, lines in it and they're made to be folded and broken off after each inspector inspected it. You can see they have names on them. One says paint, one says trim. Body, things like okay, that, right. right? Door. It's fascinating as a shop owner now, 50 some years later, to see how they handled making sure 
processes got done. Here, it's a small shop. I got, what, 15 employees. I can go out and make sure things are done. But when you're doing hundreds of thousands of cars a year, you need a system. And apparently, that's what that tag was for. At each perforation in that tag, they could break it off. They said the left door is done and on, break it off, throw it away. So if it's not there, they know it got handled. Somewhere along the line, nobody broke those tabs off. So it's all checked. The guy, the inspector says, he looks, looks at good. It, boom, did my job. So if that step. tag's gone, well, I'll be darned. That's the first time I've seen, is that the first time you've seen one all out like that? No, or? I have a couple I saved off other cars. And like I said, fortunately, that's not specific to Hemi Kudas because I've taken it's them off from 318 cars, right? It's fascinating to me to go back and see how they did it on the assembly line when they did have 10 or 20 or 30 of them every hour going down the line. And because they're putting so many out that quickly, it explains a lot of the quality issues that we see that you won't see in our cars because ours were done by one or two or three different people and we went over it and over it and over it. There, you broke off a tab. There, you put a paint mark on it. Somewhere, you said, I'm done. But was it perfect? Most likely not. I think it's because, again, human beings are doing it. People like to do things their own way. Well, Will, for example, my, my painter, you guys remember, he likes to paint with a fly in the paint. He enjoys putting flies in the paint. What the F? He's 100 miles away. He still finds a way to insult me. Why he's on vacation and I'm here trying to get it, like keep his shop going efficiently. Do you know what it's like having 30 kindergartners around here? It's a full-time job. I don't got time for that. I helped install the graphics on the 69 Barracuda. It was a really fun new process for me to be a part of, and it was really exciting to learn some of the new tricks of the trade to help me be able to do this in the future. It's really fascinating to see how many graphics go on this, but also how many are painted and how many are decals. I don't understand why they do that, but once everything's all said and done, this thing freaking pops. You know, the car, it's kind of odd, and I agree with Josh. You know, it came to doing the blackout, parts of black, parts of sticker. You know, who knows what the rhyme or reason is for it. You know, if you look closely at the valances on the corners, they're painted, and then you'll go a little bit, then it's not painted, and then there's a decal. It's all over the place, but we did exactly what factory requested. Few other things here. Battery cable, I've seen this all over the place. Oh, the battery cables, the negative cable that's painted on the engine is only part way up. No. This thing was all the way up and there's orange paint on the head I've, itself. That's the way almost all of them have been. I've hardly ever seen them that didn't have that has some on, beautiful on the line drawn right through Never. it. No, you'd blast it. Right. And it probably had a lot more on it before 50 oh, years of lead. getting jump started and well it doesn't adhere to the lead too well. Right. How about the finish on that? Everybody in the world's got their own organosol black. Now this is maybe been washed, maybe not. What do you know about the history of the car from a preservation standpoint? One of the reasons why this Survivor is better than just about all the other Survivors is because of the environment that the car was always kept in. Yes, it was driven 2,000 miles, but this car was 100% garage kept. There's no patina, there's no wear. That was the thing that was so misleading to Steve and I when we were looking at the car, like how could a Survivor be this good? And it was washed, so it may not show as crisp of an organosol finish. Even Will stuff that looks right, but doesn't have the feel. It looks, but I doesn't know. have the feel. The appearance of the shaker, and anywhere there's this organosol black, it's tough because we don't have organosol black. We don't have lacquer anymore. We're using a urethane 
and trying to make it look like that. So what we can duplicate is the finish as far as, yes, that's the right amount of sheen, it's consistent, it looks great. What we've had a hard time doing is getting the texture. That's what Tony's talking about. When you rub your hand across it, how much texture do you feel? Now on this car, a lot of the texture is still there, which is amazing. So when I get back, I wanna go over some of the formulas PPG offers and see if we can't cocktail something that has the right look, but also has the right feel. Well, it's, it's in the paint. It's in the org. That's what Organa Soul is. It's, it's like, got the suede. Yes. The suede well, gives it the mm, texture, you think? The suede is more of a sandpaper finish. That's on the dash. Gotcha. This is almost like a, a very faint black wrinkle. Okay. That's the best way I would describe it. So on the striker and on the primary and secondary latch, these are finishes I don't know how to duplicate exactly. I know there's a lot of nerdery going on with this car. I get it. It's probably a boring episode for some people. I think the aficionados are going to appreciate it, though. When you take out something like this primary latch and secondary latch for the CUDA, it's not something that's easy to duplicate. In fact, I would say it's borderline impossible to completely duplicate. Look at it. There's two or three different finishes on there. How can you duplicate that? I mean, we have something that we've done that's a paint that looks like it, but I honestly don't know if it was originally just natural metal and then it got black phosphate and this is just a worn out black phosphate, maybe with a brown hue to it. I've, I have NOS ones. The safety catches are most similar to the uh, black phosphate, but this is a multi-part safety catch. So, so like even the pin isn't you, isn't dipped. It was put together it was after put the together pieces. Afterwards, so there's really no way to restore but it properly. That, is that the truth about this? This is also a multi-part primary latch. That's got the that finish is completely different. Okay, that's what I call the greenish brown. But that's that's multi-part pieces. And on an NOS unit, you see those two big washers in the front. Yeah. Yes. I've actually seen reddish on those. On those. Even I've, though it's an assembled unit after the parts are treated. I think I sent you some pictures of some NOS I think I ones a while back. One. The reason why this car is so important to the hobby and significant of a car is because of its historic value as far as its condition. This is 100% untouched survivor. This car is a, is a reference book. You could, you could take thousands of photographs of this car and it just sets the bar on what to do, how it was done. And there's mistakes, and you're not going to want to copy the mistakes either, but it just shows you because these were built by human hands, you know, and they weren't paying attention to detail as, as a lot of the restorations are today. We found overspray of undercoating shot up on the inner fender wells and under the hood. We found runs in the organosol on the rear body panel. None of that would be tolerated on a restored car, but this car has every original nut bolt hardware on it, and you could just keep looking at the car and learning and knowing what's correct. And the cool thing is, it is a 71 Hemi Cuda. It's the highest option 71 Hemi Cuda. So it has all that good stuff on it that you wouldn't find if it was just say a four door Valiant uh, Survivor car. I mean, look at the hardware on, on the hood pin. Look at the finishes on the hardware. Right, right. It's not the shiny stuff we, where everything's zinc that we're doing or the pop-up spring that happens to have, I don't know what on it. It's not a black phosphate, but it's also not rust. Look, I don't want to be the one to point this out, okay? And, and Tony knows I love him, right? But I gotta say this last go around with him, I'm, I'm really sensing a, kind of like he's channeling a Cliff Clavin from Cheers. You guys remember that, right? Oh, a little on the back there, Nami. He's doing that. He'll say the point and then he'll elaborate on the point. And I got to figure out that's what it is. It's driving me crazy. Oh, the tur is supposed to have the paint all the way up there. Oh, a little known fact. <laughs> it's Cliff Clavin. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I see how Mark is. Just because I'm not there to defend myself, he comes at me with this Cliff Clavin stuff. The only reason I elaborate on things like the phosphate finish is I'm trying to help him. I'm trying to help him learn, which he needs to. I don't do it for my own entertainment. I got better things to do. Cliff Clavin just likes to hear himself talk. I try to educate people. If anyone is like somebody from Cheers, I'd have to say Mark is like Woody. Now back to the phosphate. It's a little known fact there, Mark. They all vary. It's not always just regular phosphate. Factory lanyard? Oh, absolutely. See, all the original ones stopped short just a hair. Mm -hmm. And some people say, oh, that's shrinkage. I really doubt that because it's also George Costanza. That kind of shrinkage?
Oh, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> that sheathing over the cable, over the lanyard, isn't shrunken. It is just stopped short of the actual piercing on the end. They did that intentionally for whatever reason. Maybe it was just the way they were manufactured, but there's a little space there. Where today when you buy a lanyard, a reproduction lanyard, it's sheathing goes all the way up to the actual coupler piece itself. All right. So basically just remember, if you're looking for an NOS one, it stops short, right? Like George's dad, remember? His, his whole stopping short, he hits the brakes in the car and stops short, so that's how he got some right? Remember when he got mad at Kramer? Because he thought Kramer stopped fast with Estelle? And he said they got in a big fight because that was his move. No, that's not no, shrinkage. This, it's not, it's the way they did. They stopped it because they had to crimp it. I've had NOS ones and they look exactly the same. See, and here's the hood pin. See itself? It's a little straight there. It's yes. not completely oh, rounded. Yeah. In fact, this crimper, look at the crimp. It actually goes up into a shoulder. Mm -hmm. So it was a very special tool. Still to come, with Mark and Tony on a field trip, are the ghouls going to succeed on their own? Or will the inmates burn down the asylum? I'm sitting here trying to run his shop, and he's up there with Tony. Surrounded by perfectly preserved icons of muscle. It's like the car was bought new and put into a, a bubble. Will Tony and Mark's hyper-focused deep dive help them to discover the secrets of this incredibly rare factory original 71 Cuda? You think we're dealing with original tires? I know they are. Yeah, oh yeah. You've checked the date. Yes. You know it. Yeah. Or is this one-of-a-kind Hemi Cuda going to be the one Mopar mystery that got away. You see how low that is to the rocker molding? Yeah. I had no idea they were doing like that. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. What you really see when you open the hood on this car versus the ones that we do and the ones that are in the shows, Chrysler was not doing them the way we're doing them. They were, the cars in general, now Hemi wasn't necessarily mass produced, but it was on a line of mass production. Right. And that's why the paint is flat. It's not beautifully shiny base clear like we do now. When you look at the paint under the hood of the cars that we do, the paint under the hood and in the door jams and in the trunk are as nice and as glossy as the rest of the car. It's just the way we do it. But they didn't at the manufacturer. It's flat. Look at the finish on it. There's no shine, no sheen to it. It doesn't look knee deep. It looks like it was an afterthought, but that's what they did. They blew paint in there just to make sure it looked red. Where they had the factory undercoating on it, they didn't, didn't look to me like they had the inspection plates in place or the access plates in place no, they definitely didn't. for no. the alignment. So that's right. So that's why we see black paint on that. That's why we see little spotches of it here and there yep. on the hood. Whereas if I sit in something like that, I think, go, what are you doing, you butcher? Yeah. If you were truly doing one that was to OE gold standards, you'd want to replicate that. Out here in this world of restoring cars, it's difficult for me to send a car home after spending a lot of money, years doing it, and see undercoating sprayed all over the engine compartment. A flat finish under the hood, runs in the rear body panel like this one has. I have to make those things perfect because I'm not an assembly line. Those could all be excused away by an assembly line, but when it's us doing it personally, it's gotta be right. How many times have you seen on the uh, firewall top of the cowl runs in the, in the Absolutely. paint? Absolutely, down the, down the top of it, yeah. yeah. Transparent on this side and pouring down on that side. This is a February 71 built car. Yes. And this is something I didn't notice, the first, or I forgot that I noticed if I did. This doesn't have crush ribs. No crush zones And that was this. supposed to have started from Late January 70, 1st. Right? January 1st and later. That's what the TSB says, or the bulletin says. Right. Here's an example of how cars are mass produced and how even assembly line people can either make a mistake or sometimes it's supply and demand. Look at the crush zones that are not in that hood. This car was built in February of 1971, I believe. In January of 1970, they were supposed to all get the crush zone style hoods. That was a, a safety feature, right? Here's a car that was clearly built a month or more afterwards that has a regular hood on it. And Tony explained his thought was maybe they had more hoods ordered than they ever needed to use. You put in the crush release For hood. safety, you know, yeah. so the hood would crush instead of coming in. And what does that mean? So how did this obviously original paint hood, how 
did this original paint hood go on a car that was built in February of 71? Right. Over a year and two months after it was supposed to be a non a crushed zone style. Well, now I'm going to do everybody a great big solid right here. Okay. Tony's answer to that, why he thinks it could have happened, which is speculation, was a two hour answer. The time they started getting on cars was a little bit later in the year. Now you also have to remember. So unless you're sitting at the bar at Cheers drinking beer for the next two hours, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. And this is only a guess. I, I can't say I know it for sure. He's but... saying that since the shaker option was a fairly rare option, it is very possible that they had a lot of the 70s style non crush zone hoods left over from the run and they just put them on. Maybe they didn't pay attention to the federal mandate. I think basically that's what he's trying to say. Sorry to butt in here, Woody, but that's not exactly what I said. I said that since the shaker was a rare option, that they may, and I'm only guessing here, may have had some leftover hoods from the original production run. It's a little known fact that only about 6% of the people All right, I want to talk to you about the wheels, the valve core extension, some of the exterior trim. Another cool thing about this car is the options on it. I mean, this car had two window stickers. It's just, it goes from front to back with louvers, spoilers, mirrors, radio, cassette deck. Funny thing I want to tell you about the front spoilers. The front spoilers are not So Mark asked me to put together this little 69 A57 Cuda, and right off the bat I knew it was going to be a challenge because we built a lot of B bodies, we built a lot of E bodies, but not too many A bodies. So very unique problem solving we had to go into this one. I knew it was going to take a lot of work and a lot of teamwork in particular, so I asked Mark if I could get some help, and uh, lucky enough this guy here was able to come over and help me put this car together. Damn. <laughs> Once we had this jigsaw puzzle figured out with all of these pieces, all the pieces were restored, ready to go. We laid everything out, figured out exactly which fasteners we needed, and then we started putting the thing together, started assembling this car from the back to the front. All right, brother, let's get this bad boy in there, huh? So the very first part we installed was the cargo base. Next, we installed the lower quarter trim panels left and right. Yeah, that's snapped Get those in up. nice. All right, let's see how well she lays down in there. There are so many different colors in that car. It is difficult figuring out what exactly needed to be what color and getting all that trim on there without, you know, scuffing all that freshly done stuff is a little bit of a challenge, too. Yeah, we definitely kept old Willie busy back there, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, well, would you say, Josh, there's about 17 shades of blue inside that car? Yeah, it seems like it. I think we got her uh, down a little bit more than that, but originally, yeah, there's a lot of different shades of blue. So after we installed the lower quarter trim panels, we moved on and installed the garnish panels. There's an upper garnish panel on the left and right and a center garnish panel in the rear. All right. So in addition to those colors, Josh, we had to be real careful about the finish itself. Sometimes they had a semi-gloss, sometimes they had more of a satin finish, and maybe even a glossy finish at times. Oh yeah, I think uh, we had to we'll change one or two pieces after we figured out what gloss they needed. Absolutely. With the interior trim panels in place, the next part was the fold-down cargo door. When I first saw this thing coming through, I wasn't a real big fan of it, honestly. But man, the more and more this thing came together, getting that interior in there, seeing some of the decals go on, it really is a sweet car, and I, I'm a big fan. So once we had all of those pieces in the car, we were able to move forward a little bit. We got the rear seat installed, the, the rear carpet, and some lower trim panels in the rear, and voila, the whole back of the car was done. And then we could stand back, and wow, one of the most beautiful interiors I've ever seen. Certainly one of the most beautiful I've ever been able to be a team and put together. Straight to the top. I 
can tell, pretty much original paint. Maybe a little brush touch here and there. Yeah, very minor. But you know one thing that's funny, and somewhere I had pictures of this, it's original paint, there might be a couple little touch-ups on it, but one funny fact was that the original owner, Zachary Reynolds, he had Zach lettered with paint on the driver's door. He had oh, pinstripe. He did it, he kind of personalized it, like we did in the 70s. Pinstriping around the billboard. Zach Reynolds typically had the cars pinstriped and lettered to, uh, to personalize them. And he had done this to this car, like some cards, like an ace of spades or something like that on the top of the trunk lid at the back. And uh, he had pinstriping around the billboards on the quarter panels oh, and no a couple kidding. little things. So where is it now? It was able, to, because it was paint, it was able to be chipped off. Just thumbnail it off and then buff. Oh, right, because it, if you look at it in the right lights, you might be able to see a shadow. The custom lettering thing and the pinstriping, our, our fans from my era will certainly remember it. There was somebody in every town that was great. We had Jimmy Carmichael. But they would go out and for 50 bucks, 100 bucks, they would pinstripe your car. And a lot of times they personalized your car. When we were growing up, you go up to the gut on Willamette Street cruising around and there was something cool on every cool car. And that is a great representation of the era and that's what happened in this car. The uh, door edge guards, right. factory, again, yep. the most loaded Hemikuda in history. Yeah, 71 at least. I don't know if we compared it to a 70, but I think 71's had more options available than 70, so. Gotcha. Okay, the two-tone line, you see how low that is to the rocker mold yeah. itself. It's not split in the middle. You we, say two-tone, you mean the rocker panel blackout? I mean, the yeah, the rocker okay. panel blackout. So now we're looking at a car that's never been restored. We're looking at the blackout line, the rocker blackout line that was mandatory on your 71 Kudas. We always believed, based on engineering drawings that we've seen and based on other cars that had been restored, that they pretty much ran that line right in the middle of the rocker molding itself. Now, if you look at the one we did on our beautiful Phoenix Cuda that Will did, he took it upon himself to even go higher than that. Don't know why, that was his option. I guess he wanted to do that. This one you can see clearly, it's lower than that. It's nearly outside the footprint of the rocker molding itself. Yeah, the rocker panel blackout where it meets the red mm -hmm. is actually not right in the middle of the molding. It's right. not at the top. It's really favoring more of the bottom of the molding. Mm -hmm. And that's factory. I can't argue with that. So I'll be showing that to Will because there's some error. Another 100 mile away shot by ice tray or ice pick or, you know. So I'm sitting here trying to run a shop and he's up there probably having his third lunch for the day with Tony. But that's how this car was built. Sure. You know, in fairness, you could maybe go grab another original paint car right. that's higher than that or lower than that. Right. I think you could look at 20 of them and you'd see that line all over the place because it, remember, it was a human being doing it, not a robot. I believe that the original idea was to split the line where the rocker molding went. Valve stem caps, so Va gotta extensions. hear about that. The okay. valve stem cap extension or valve cap extension. Valve stem extensions, yeah. The valve stem extensions were installed on, from Chrysler products at least that I know, on every car that had trim rings or full wheel covers. But they weren't installed on the assembly line, nope. neither the trim rings or the extension. Right. They were in the trunk for the dealer prep guy. Yeah. I know about the hubcaps and installing these pieces because I did it for a living. I did it at Central Lincoln Mercury. I was the PDI guy, pre-delivery inspection. I mean, a Lincoln or a Mercury came in off the truck pull it in, it's covered in plastic. They didn't have the hubcaps on them when they came off the truck. They didn't have the valve stem extensions on. So that was just part of many things that you had to do in PDI. Sometimes you had to unwrap all of the seats that were covered in plastic. You had to take a protective film off of the front leading edge of the hood because they come out on railroad boxcars. Things that the PDI guy had to do this is a great example of it. It's also a perfect example of the minutiae when you start talking about how right is right. How right is right? Is that an assembly line valve stem extension that was put on on the assembly line or meant to go on the assembly line? Or is it one that somebody bought over the counter? That's the difference between winning perhaps an OE gold and not even placing at one of the national events. Now the original OEM assembly line caps have a white cap on them, it's flat on the end with a little hole in the middle of it. And that's only on the assembly lines. Well, that's this one. Not many service ones got that because I have service ones from back in the day and they have a, a steel ball. And then the later ones had a white cap again, but it was domed. 
So this was something that they changed. Do you think we're dealing with original tires? I know they are. Yeah, yeah. You've checked the date. Yes. You know it. Yeah. You know, and one thing funny while we're looking there, if you look at the quarter panel, the way it's attached to the trunk floor extension, it's not lined up the best. You guys do a better job on it. Yeah, I see that too. Uh, know me there, you know, what you guys take into consideration is the uh, mass produced the guys. That's when the quarter extension doesn't exactly meet the quarter panel. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just Cliff Clavin. A little factor about the quarter panels, eh, mommy. All kidding aside, a really cool thing is this car has original tires on it. That's right, original tires. Take that in for a minute. How many of you have flat tires when they're a week old? How many of them wear out, puncture, hit a curb? These are the original tires that started life with. These are date coated tires. That's how original this car is. That's why you have to take this whole thing in as a carbon copy of the original footprint of how they were supposed to be built. The original DNA on this car cannot be overstated. This car, starting at the front bumper and working your way to the rear bumper, is as close to original and new as you could get if you didn't take a car and just lock it in a vault somewhere the day it was made. We documented it from the very front to the very back. When we got into the trunk, I went to school. That thing is filled with original DNA markers that I had no idea they were doing like that. Stay tuned. Will these feuding friends? But if you look at this one a little bit close, part with their pride and uncover the secrets in this one of a kind 1971 Hemi Cuda. It's like the car was bought new and put into an, uh, a bubble. Or will the overwhelming options in what is possibly the most optioned 71 Hemi Cuda on earth? I haven't seen that before. Wind up stumping the masters of Mopar, Warman and D'Agostino. I might figure out what happened on the Hamtramck assembly line, but then the LA assembly line is different. St. Louis is different, Lynch Road is different. This is it, I'm in awe. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. We could literally spend a week, I think, on a car like this. I, I would never imagine that the bolts that hold the latch and the trunk were actually screwed into the vertical lock support when it was painted. Taken out, the latch put on, because this is opposite of what you see at the front. So one of the areas that I've really got to find out what was happening on the assembly line Keep in mind, I might figure out what happened on the Hamtramck assembly line, but then the LA assembly line is different, St. Louis is different, Lynch Road is different. But at least in this particular case, it was clear that the bolts that hold the latch for the trunk were in place when the vertical support got painted. I haven't seen that before. Usually when you're adding a part to something, like you're adding a latch after it's been painted, then the bolts would be raw. Go up to the front striker. The bolts are raw that hold the striker to the core support, but the core support's been painted, the latch tray's been painted. So why different on this one? They want it the same color, so they put it on before fitment, and then after they went to close it, they realized it had to be adjusted, so you right. see the- and that's why you see these. You see the scar of it, yeah. So we could do the same, we could actually, if we were gonna mimic it, right. we could put it in place where it goes, and then slide it over for paint, and then when it goes back on, move it back where we already knew it went, but it would have this, intentional mark because you guys pre-fit it it's really a hand-built car what you're doing right where this is going down you know this production is a deck line. lid after deck lid after right. deck lid going down i got you now is that an inspector marking probably saying everything's okay under here yeah most likely yeah, probably maybe has something to do with the uh the spoiler stuff meaning it was adjusted i'm guessing so i'm looking at your side you're probably looking at mine over here yeah the side markers were installed when the car was painted okay so the side marker housings were painted red and in the trunk, you could see 99% of the retainer is also red. They've painted actually body paint color. on the retainer and the nuts. But if you look at this one a little bit closer, because I, this is a billboard car, the backside of the retainer- Oh, there's no overspray The, the backside of the housing is natural. How could that be if everything else is red? Because it's a billboard right, car. Right, when they put the billboards on, they it get the painted ones, marker. chuck them out. And that's why if you notice on the back of the housings, it says black and, yeah, white. and white. Right, remember, on a 71 Cuda, an option, not standard equipment, was the billboard graphic. You've seen us do many of them. We did one on a purple 71 convertible. We did it on the, the Phantasm car. We put these on, you know what they are. 
On the assembly line, they wanted to make sure they put the car together as quickly as possible. So if a car had a white billboard, it should have a white side marker housing. We just paint them white, didn't care. Back then, they wanted to grab a white one or a black one. Those are only two colors for a billboard stripe. So on the back side of the actual housing itself, it'll say white or black. They'll say right hand or left hand. That was assembly line stuff. As we go over this car and we document it from the very front to the back, I'm only giving you just small snippets of what we find. You realize that there's a lot of history both with the car, there's a lot of history that went into the assembly of the car, things that we need to learn. And I really believe in my heart that learning how it was done back then, even though it would be borderline impossible to duplicate everything. I talked about that. I think it's important to the hobby. That's the main thing. There are things that are important to the hobby. I'm a preserver of the hobby. So being that this car is all original and it was so, so well preserved, you did see some of the factory flaws, like Mark and I were looking at the or running the organosol on the rear body panel. And Mark said to me, he goes, if I was restoring a car like this, of course you wouldn't restore this car because of its condition, but just say it was still original but left outside behind somebody's house and you could see that it still had that run in it. He goes, do I put it back? And you know, you, you don't really because you'd be explaining it the whole time. You know, people wouldn't know it. You'd almost have to have a sign on the car next to the run. This is what we did and how it looked before and how it looks now. And, and that's why restoration cars are sometimes more perfect than they were originally because they are being hand built. We could literally spend a week, I think, on a car like this. And then we could go underneath it. There's, there's oh my gosh, all kinds of stuff underneath the car. Maybe that'll be another visit. That's a fantastic car. While looking at this car and looking back at the car, this is it, I'm in awe. This is just such a reference. I've referred back to photos of this car throughout the past 20 years and still will. And I know it's helped Mark out too sometimes with just looking for stuff. It's like the car was bought new and put into an, a bubble. And it's just there for all of us to learn from. So at the end of our first day up there, we were able to get three cars looked at, but it took almost, I think, 12 hours. There's, there's a lot, right? There's, this was the most original one, so we spent more time on it. Uh, afterwards, we had a chance to walk around and look at everything. We, we looked at everything too, not just the Mopars for those of you. There's some fascinating cars. I would like to especially thank the, the Brothers Collection for letting us, opening their doors and letting us go in there and wander around with our camera team for an entire day. That was just really cool. But again, the thing I take away from it all is how important it is to know how a car was made originally. We know we're doing it a little bit different. We're trying, but we're doing, it's better. I think what we're doing is better. I think that's easier sell than doing something worse, for sure. You know, when you walk around a place like that and you see the incredible inventory of cars, and some cars, I think there was a Mustang there with four miles on it. Some ridiculous thing. I wish I was a Ford guy because I would have documented that car like crazy too. But again, not to, not to beat a dead horse, but the most important thing is that we preserve the hobby in the integrity it originally started. Don't modify anything. Don't say something was the way it wasn't. It may not be perfect, but that is the way it is. The overspray, the undercoating, the dull paint, the runs in the organosol on the back end of the car, and quarter panel extensions that don't fit the quarter panels very well. Trunk floor extensions that don't follow the shape of the quarter. We do a lot better job here, but ours aren't really necessarily exactly the way they were on the assembly line, just a little better. Preserve the integrity of the history of these cars. That is my goal.